Hi, how's everybody doing today? This is Rich from Rich to Be Live with our very special guest. It is Tan Tran from Vamonti Group, streaming live on Twitter. How are you doing today, Tan? Hey, Tan? Yep, I'm doing good, Rich. Thanks for asking. How are you today? I'm doing fantastic. We are streaming live on Twitter. Thank you guys for watching all over the world. And we're really excited about doing this interview today and doing this video today. Um, I did an overview on your company and very excited about what you guys are doing. The stock is actually up a little bit today and there's a lot of investor interest. So we talked about this and we thought, why don't we just go live on Twitter? We're gonna record this video and then we will post it on YouTube later on on Rich TV Live as well and get in front of your investors, get in front of the community of investors on Twitter and all over the world that wanna learn more about Vomanti Group and just kind of go through what you guys are doing why you're doing it and where you want to go with the company. Um, so first and foremost, can you give us a status on your OTCQB listing? Yeah, I mean, that's, um, I mean, that the, the uplisting process, right, is, um, is going through very nicely. Uh, we're finishing up our 2018-19 um, audits. And next we have our attorney uh, working on the SEC filings, specifically is the form S1 filing. And where we are actually describing our business case and the reason for our uplisting. Um, it is uh, it's making very, very good you know, pro uh, progress. And I'm, I'm happy, I'm quite happy with that. And we, originally we were targeting to be on OTCQB by Q2. Um, I think we're going to be on QB much, much sooner than that. Wow. My hope is that uh, like around Christmas time or right after Christmas time, we should be on QB. That would be fantastic. That's not, that's right around the corner guys. So that'll be a huge catalyst for the company. And you guys have done extremely well going from sub penny to today. We're right around 40 cents. Amazing, amazing success. And one of the things that I really like about your company is that you have a whole bunch of different focuses from blockchain to doing business in Vietnam to potentially acquiring gold mines. And I wanna go into the gold mine. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the gold project in West Africa? Yeah. So we touched on this uh, a couple of times with you know uh, my recent interviews and also our uh, last uh, press report, I mean, uh, press release. The negotiation is going very nicely. Um, when, I mean, but a, a deal is never done until it's done. But let's just say that, let's just say that um, I'm actually looking into making plans to travel to Africa. How's that? Wow. That's huge. Um, but the, the point of why, a lot of people have asked me this, Rich, why are we looking at, you know, Go uh, uh, investing in or acquiring a gold related business. Given, let's just step back a little bit, right? Given what's going on uh, with uh, the global pandemic and also the transition to digital finance, um, I, I truly believe as a company, uh, I truly believe that uh, the future of money is digital, the future of gold is digital, the, uh, the, the, um, the future of uh, Funds and assets is digital, all right? Um, the point of us making a play in gold is this. We want to be able to come up with our own cryptocurrency. We want to be able to have, to have a gold-backed um, stable coin. That way, I mean, that way we can have, um, we can tear off into many different applications. Like, you know, like we can create our own lending protocol. If you looked into like um, DeFi applications, I mean, with a gold-backed asset, with a stable asset like gold, we can actually you know, create our own lending protocol. And this is what FinTech is all about, right? FinTech is about you know, economic empowerment. Absolutely. Using, I mean, I, I really like Bitcoin too, Rich, but Bitcoin is not really practical in commercial usage. 
right? It's more like store of value. Uh, whereas gold has been time to test it. And if you have a cryptocurrency, you know, uh, packed to the gold and backed by gold, now you can actually create your own native state, stable coin to have commercial value and commercial usage. And that, that's why we're interested in, in the gold play. I love it. I love it. A fintech company that wants to create a stable coin that's backed by gold. And there's very few companies that have that, if any, that I can think of. I know I've heard some companies say that they wanted to have their coins backed by gold. But do you know of any coins that are backed by gold right now that are successful that you can think of? The, yeah, there, there are a few of them, right? There are a few yeah. go back um, coins out in the marketplace today. Like XAUT and you got Paxo Gold. Okay. But it's not so much about it's not so much about having a go back coin, Rich. What you need to have first is an ecosystem where you can actually deploy the, uh, the coin, right? And this is why we're so interested in fintech plays because what we're doing right now, we're creating an ecosystem where decentralized um, and, and decentralized you know, financial services uh, can be accessed by the unbanked, but the underbanked in the emerging world. So it, it, it's, like I said, you know, it's, not, it's not so much about having you know, a go back coin. I mean, you can have, you can go out there in the marketplace today and there are many, many uh, go back coins. But where are you going to deploy that, that that coin, right? So this is you know, this is why we in plays like uh, like Elon and and funded, right? It's about okay. It's about uh, creating an ecosystem first. And a lot of a lot of people have come to me and asked me. They say, "What is so sexy about what you do? You're in the lending business. What's so sexy about that?" I say, "Well, that's not. It's not so sexy at all. The only sexy part is that it makes money." <laughs> and also what we're doing right now is that we're actually creating an ecosystem. We're establishing that the, the relationship, the trust, right? Um, if, we, if you ever been to an emerging um, market, which you know that a lot of people don't have access to financial services. A lot of, I mean, as a matter of fact, matter of fact, uh, about 40% of adults, which is about 1.8 you know, billion people, and over 200 million SMEs have limited or no access to banking services, right? But how do you how do you view something that's so innovative and get them to embrace it, right? Is it, it you know you can build an AI driven blockchain you know driven platform and everything fully automated, everything online, but if people don't embrace it, then what's the point? So what you do at first is that you give them some, something that they need. So that's why we started out in the landing business in Elon, right? That is just you know an on-ramp process for us. Right? Once you give them something they need, now you have that trusted relationship. Now you can start deploying other services, other products. This is also at the same time, this is what I call uh, low hanging fruit, Rich. It allows us to generate revenues and profits right away. I mean, that's, that's, that's a result of what we do, right? But that's not the focus of what we do. The focus of what we do is about economic empowerment and also creating an impact. Um, so, if, you know, I knew all along that this is what we set out to do. So that's why we wanted to get something started in the lending business. But now that we have started on that, now the next step for us is to create our own cryptocurrency, our own, what I call playing the role of like being our own central bank, right? In order to be able to do that, you gotta have an underlying asset. You can't just, you know, create a coin and get, you know, people to, 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 uh, to employ it. I mean, you gotta have something to underpin it. And, and that's, that's the reason why we're very, very interested in gold. Now, you mentioned it a little bit, Fund it, your e-loan platform. Can you give us an update on how it's coming together? Uh, the last update was that uh, we, we, we told the market uh, about our recent funding of $30 million from two US-based institutional investors. So the good news is we got money coming in 
I mean, but that also comes with challenges. Okay, I want to be very honest, very you know, transparent to everybody. And the challenge is that how do we scale up, right? Can we scale up fast enough to spend that money? Okay, it's a good problem to have. I mean, believe me. I mean, but um, given what's going on with uh, with COVID nineteen, when you move, we're moving forward. Well, we're moving forward very cautiously. Um, so. But overall, I'm happy with what's going on with Elon. We got the money coming in, we just need to spend it wisely and we need to deploy it you know, fast to help the SMEs at the ground level. But uh, we are on track to, uh, to hit our revenue targets in, uh, for this year and next year. So wow. that's fantastic. Can we, can we go into that a little bit more? I find it fascinating what you're doing. Can, can you explain why you chose to focus on the Vietnam market, because I think that that is really what makes you unique, is that you have this focus on the Vietnam market. Um, can you talk a little bit about why you chose that market? Yeah, it's not, okay, so we, we just happened to, uh, to start from Vietnam, but our focus is not just Vietnam rich, right? So when I set out to build this company um, about four years ago, it is uh, what we really want to do, or what I really truly believe in is that whatever we do, we gotta be, uh, we gotta be out there to make an impact. I mean, to, to, to empower people, right? Um, I mean, like I said earlier, I mean, I think access to financial services is the fundamental is a fundamental right for every human being. Um, so, with that belief in mind, I mean, we started, you know, working and how the way we do that is that we work with early stage fintech companies um, in emerging markets because. In the emerging world, as you know, I mean, a lot of people are still unbanked and very underbanked. And that's why we work with um, uh, a lot of fintech companies in, the, in, in, in those countries. And we just happen to find good investment opportunities for our shareholders, right? But the point is this, if from, if from an organizational standpoint, in our, in, in our company and everything we do, this is the point that I, I use to inspire all the employees. And, and also all the people that, uh, that are, uh, that are part of our, you know, our, our journey, right? Including our shareholders and everything. It's not so much about what we do. It's not about so much about how we do. It's about why we do the things we do, right? And if if you truly believe in what I believe and what we believe in, then you should join us. We would love to have you. If you're looking for, uh, you know, just a quick investment or a quick profit, they are more funded a lot more companies out there, better funded, uh, better qualified. I mean, and you should look at those companies, but if you truly, truly believe in what we do, uh, we would love to have you. What I love about what you're doing with eLoan, and I've done a lot of research on this, is you're giving the average person, people like me, an investor, the opportunity to invest with eLoan directly to help small, medium, size enterprises. How did you come up with that concept? I, I really like that, where you get an average person getting a chance to invest in a small business to help that small business thrive and flourish and creating a win-win situation where the investor wins, the small business yeah. wins, and obviously you and your company. Well, and- yeah, like, like I said, every, everything we do is about um, creating equal access to financial services, right? Uh, giving companies in the emerging economies access to US capital markets. Giving smaller investors in the US access to opportunities in emerging markets where traditionally only reserved for big VCs or big PE guys. 100%. Right? Imagine, let's say, as a, as a retail investor right now, if you only have about 10,000, 5,000, 20,000 to invest, and you really like the space, let's say, in Vietnam, how would you even do that, Rich? Without being highly connected, 
to a VC fund. And by the way, even if you're connected to a VC fund, I mean, your average ticket is about $250,000, a half a million dollars, right? And your money is locked in for about five to seven years. That's just how they work. Um, so this is, we see ourselves as kind of like the gateway, um, you know, for smaller investors and also for entrepreneurs from the emerging market. But I want to go back to what you were asking me earlier about Vietnam, right? Why is Vietnam so special? Why are we focusing on Vietnam? And you can look at the, the facts and the figures about Vietnam through, you know, sources like Bloomberg or CNBC. Vietnam has, um, from, in terms of GDP growth, is only behind China, second to China in the last 20 years. A lot of people don't pay attention to that, but that's, that's a fact. Um, it's been growing on the average of 67%. It was on track to hit about 8% this year, and then it got you know, hit with COVID-19. Uh, but even with COVID-19, it's still projected to grow about 4, 5, uh, 4 to 5 percent, which is outstanding compared to, you know, what we have here. Um, what's interesting about Vietnam is that 65 percent of the population is under the age of 35. Wow. Very well educated. And by the way, Vietnam is, is, a, is a very, very populated, right? Over, I mean, uh, about 100 million people. More than the you know more than the population of California, New York, and Florida combined. It's a huge market for U.S. companies. Think of companies like you know Procter and Gamble. Because for years, right, uh, Chinese Chinese made products, consumer products, been filling markets like Vietnam. But now, with the living standards going up, people are more pro-American, especially American products. That, that opens up you know, all kinds of opportunities for American companies. But another, another thing why Vietnam is so attractive, because you got you know, young population, very skilled, but the labor cost is still so low compared to China, right? So I'll give you an example. Let's say you know, with the wages going up in China, uh, right now, the average worker is anywhere from you know fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars a month. Right? The average factory worker in Vietnam is two hundred to five hundred dollars. Right? That's a huge cost saving. Huge. Yeah, but then if you want, if you're looking for cheap labor, you can go to many many places. Right? You can go there. Are many. The reason why Vietnam is so interesting is because no matter what, China remains the manufacturing hub of the world. So if you're gonna move somewhere, you're gonna move your factory somewhere, you need to move somewhere physically uh, that, that allows you to be physically close to the existing supply chains in China. So with Vietnam right next to China, and it's only a few hundred kilometers away from Guangzhou and Shenzhen, areas like Guangzhou and Shenzhen, Southern China, which is the manufacturing hub uh, of the, the entire world. That allows companies to move their manufacturing operations to Vietnam and then remain close to you know, the existing supply chain. That's what makes Vietnam so interesting. So the last 20 years, a lot of, um, a lot of companies actually have um, started moving slowly into Vietnam, but mostly on low value added goods, right? Uh, because of the labor cost. But lately you start seeing people like Samsung, Apple, a lot of high-tech companies are now starting to move to Vietnam and also with Foxconn. You know that company Foxconn, right? Also re-announced that they're planning to build a manufacturing plant in Vietnam. So you got a lot of positives going on you know, in Vietnam. But what's happening is that, so at the top-down level, things are looking very, very positive for Vietnam. But at the ground level, 40% of, um, of the GDP um, comprised of SMEs, which are still very underfunded, underserved, and this is the space that we're going after. Now, and this is, you know, and it, like I said, it's about us, you know, making an impact, helping the middle class entrepreneurs. I'm looking at uh, the stock, and the stock's been performing very, very well. We got 262 people watching right now. Um, so we've got lots of uh, people were watching and, 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 and getting interested in this company. Why would an investor be interested in investing in Vamanti Group? Well, 
like I said earlier, Rich, if, if you're looking for a company that has a portfolio in the emerging market, if you're looking for companies that has companies in the twin tech space, there are better funded companies, there are better qualified companies to do that. But like I said, it, it, for us, it's about why we do the things we do. And if we, if you believe in what we believe and you want to be part of the journey, I mean, we love to have you and we, and this, we should, you, you definitely should take a close look at the company. I think that uh, you guys are doing something very unique. I think you guys are doing something very special. Let's talk a little bit about Bitcoin. Bitcoin's been on fire. Um, We've talked about this actually, and we both felt like Bitcoin was going to go higher and it has. And today we talked about Bitcoin hitting 14,000. What do you think the future of Bitcoin is? Is Bitcoin going to be digital gold? Like everybody says, is it going to change the world? I believe it will. Yeah. I want to hear your opinion about Bitcoin. Obviously it hit 14,000 today, highest it's been in a year. Does this continue? What do you think about Bitcoin? Why do you love black blockchain and Bitcoin and the technology of uh, Bitcoin and blockchain technology so much? Well, this is what I like. Uh, so it's not so much about, you know, Bitcoin that I like is I, 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 I'm, I'm actually more fascinated, more passionate about the underlying technology because it opens up all kinds of applications and opportunities for us to deploy um, impactful financial services, right? Um, blockchain allows just a simple transaction. Let's say regardless of where you are physically, Rich, okay, you should be allowed to buy, sell, and trade for goods and services, correct? Without relying on this, you know, having somebody in the middle like a bank, like an intermediary. Well, what if you want to do business with somebody in Africa, in Latin America, in Asia, and they happen not to have a bank account, Rich? Right? Yeah. Uh, they, they don't have- you. And, have and then if, if somebody in those countries, in those regions, they have something that you like, how would you? How would they receive payments from you? I mean, so this is this is a, you know a small example of, of what blockchain can do. Uh, it's all about. It's not about and you know uh, 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 not about something innovative. I mean, you have many many innovative technologies coming you know across our desk every day, right? It's, but the point about blockchain is about economic empowerment. Is about carrying out you know cross you know cross border transactions. Now, people, no matter where you are, and regardless of your social status, right, you can carry out transactions directly without relying on somebody in the middle. So I'm really high on the technology itself. Now, Bitcoin itself is a nice asset to have, and I think it's going to continue to appreciate even more. I mean, you've seen articles about Bitcoin hitting like a hundred thousand, a million dollars. I don't think that's far-fetched at all. I mean, giving the limited supply of Bitcoin. Um, so we are also looking at Bitcoin, acquiring Bitcoin as you know, you know, adding that to our portfolio. But what we really focus on is the underlying technology, Rich. I mean, what I, I, I a lot of people, and this is, I, I use this analogy to explain to people. What Bitcoin is to blockchain is very similar to what email is to the internet. That's just one application. That is not what the internet is about, right? I mean, remember when we first launched, I mean, when the internet became very prevalent in the mid nineties, the early nineties, mid nineties. I mean, that was one of the first applications everybody jumped on email. But think where the internet is today. Look at all kinds of possibilities, all kinds of applications. And that's, you know, that's why we're very, very high on blockchain. Let's go back to Vamanti Group. Now, Vamanti Group is a company that I really like because you guys have done things a lot the right way. First of all, your share structure. When I look into a company, one of the very first things I do is I look at the share structure. If a company has 50 million shares or less, 
I consider that a very tight share structure. If they've got 50 million shares or less in the float, I consider that a tight float. Can you talk a little bit about your share structure and why you structured it like this and what your plan is for the company moving forward? Well, we, we, this, this goes back to what I've been saying, you know, all morning, which is about, you know, everything we do is about what we do. I mean, by what we do, not so much about what we do and how we do it, right? So we really need to have a strong base of uh, shareholders who actually believe in, you know, what we do and who, you know, and those are the people that are willing to stay with us, you know, through the thicks and thins, right? To the different cycles, uh, economic cycles. In order to do that, you have to protect them. And um, you have to protect them and meaning that, you know, you gotta have a strong capitalization structure. Um, and so we, 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 we consciously maintain a very tight structure. Uh, we don't have, you know, we don't have, uh, we don't have convertible notes. We don't have toxic financing. Uh, I mean, everything is completely transparent out in the open. I mean, we don't do deals and then, you know, have people come in and actually blindside our shareholders, right? I mean, and like, like I said, is then this goes back to you know, it is about um, why we do the things we do, and one part of that is to protect our shareholders, and that's why we have the structure, very tight structure. And I really like that, and that's one of the keys for my style of trading is to look for companies that have very tight floats. And when we got a chance to look at your share structure, it just jumped off the page. I believe your float is like eight million shares. Is that correct? Something like that. Like really tight, is that correct? Well, obviously we have we have sixty five million shares outstanding, so the, the float is never you know is not going to remain you know at eight million. So that's what we have right now. Yes, I think part of it is because a lot of your shareholders, I mean, they just, I mean, some of our original shareholders are still holding on to their shares. Rich, um, they're long term investors. They're long term. They, they are all long term and. So if everybody if everybody decides to unleash you know their shares on the open market, obviously the float is going to go up. But I I mean I have I have shareholders you know telling me that they're not selling until the stock hits at least ten dollars. I mean so I have shareholders been with us for four or five years and I talk to them every day. And I, I mean and I, I enjoy talking to shareholders. I mean each week I talk to at least two three shareholders. And because no. I, I really believe in that human connection, which I mean, I mean, shareholders, uh, you know, shareholders and uh, you know everybody else, right? They have many, many investment opportunities. Why should they invest in me? And know that I just say, why should they invest in me, not the company? Because at the end of the day, you know, they believe in what I do. They believe in my vision. That's why they're investing. It's not VM and T they're investing in. They're investing in me, which. And I, I, I mean, it's an honor for me. And I, I, you know, I take great, great responsibility in making sure that, you know, we put the money to good use. And at the same time, we, you know, uh, we protect our, I, I don't consider everybody uh, that holding shares of Amanti shareholders. I actually consider them like part owners actually. And, and that's the way I think about them. They are. I mean, your shareholders are owners in the stock, right? They're supporting the business. They support the deal, um, especially the early stage investors that are holding the stock. They, they definitely believe in the company and they're holding the shares because they believe that there's upside. And the company's already been very successful. If you look at the stock, stock went from half a penny to 40 cents. That's 80 times your money. So there's investors that have already had a chance to do extremely well. And the fact mm -hmm. that they're holding proves and shows that they're in here for the long haul. Now, for an investor that's looking at this stock right now, uh, just traded just under 80,000 shares, just around 39 and a half cents. What is your end goal for this company? We've talked about this, but I want to share this with the shareholders. What's your end goal? You know, uh, for a company that's at 40 cents today, is there a target for how much money you want to raise? And 
a share price that you have as far as a target you want to set that you want to talk to your shareholders say okay yeah well well it's all it's all project dependent rich so we don't we don't set out to let's say oh we're going to raise you know 10 million dollars we're going to raise 20 million dollars are we going to hit 10 dollars a share or 100 dollars a share right we do things in step we do things organically and everything is, you know, project dependent. Um, we we don't pay so much attention about what everybody else is doing. Um, so, for instance, let's say let's go back to this particular, you know, gold deal in West Africa. Okay. If we need to do capital injection, we're gonna figure out a way that we can inject capital in this business in a such such a friendly way that we don't dilute our existing shareholders. But at the same time, at the same time, we um, we allow you know this this company to get to the next level. I mean, I'm I'm not at liberty to disclose what, what we're working on right now. But I'm I'm just my point here is that we do try our best to not to you know um, to give away equity unless we absolutely absolutely have to, and we only take money as we need. Let's say I only need $10 million, then that's all I'm gonna take, okay? Uh, I'm not gonna take $20 million. I'm gonna take $10 million because I know once I deploy that $10 million, the company is gonna be 10X, 20X in terms of valuation, right? So it's all about you know, taking, my, um, taking what we need, taking in money you know, as we need it, not, you know, uh, not more than what we need, and and that's the mentality that you know that uh, that, that we uh, conduct ourselves with. Now, um, another point I want to make is that we, you know, obviously revenues and, and, and profits, right? Is 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 the is the uh, is, is the end game and also is the goal of what we do. But I see that, I look at that as a result of what we do. As long as we believe in what we do and we execute and we, we're making the right plays with the right people, with the right asset, um, I think the end result will be there. I think it's important that investors know the plan. And we've talked about this. And the only reason why companies go public the number one reason why companies go public is to raise money, right? So in order for a public company to get access to capital, typically the only way to get access to that capital is to issue shares. Now, a company that's very concerned about issuing shares will not try to issue shares at a low price because if you issue shares at a low price, like you use the number 10 million. Well, if you're looking to raise $10 million and your stock's at 40 cents, you're gonna have to issue 25 million shares. Now, if your stock's at a dollar, that's 10 million shares. If your stock's at $10, it's only a million shares. So one of the reasons that companies go public, and I'm constantly reminding people of this, is to raise capital. And so many times when companies' stocks go up, and we've, we found so many companies that are undervalued, that explode, like yourself, that go up 80 times, 100 times, and then they raise capital. And then people are like, oh my goodness, they're raising capital dilution. This is what everybody says in the market. They've got this really, this mentality of every time a company raises money, it's dilution. But my response to that is Tesla has to raise money. Apple has to raise money. TD Bank has to raise money. They all do it. Every single company that's public does it. They all do stock offerings to raise capital. That's why they're public. Because when you're public, you have this additional right. resource, this additional tool that you can use, which is shares, to raise capital. So would you agree that that's a necessary part of being a public company? And that instead of having so many people be afraid of the dilution, I think they have to understand that that's part of the business. Right. Would you agree with that? Well, Yes, yes, definitely, right? Um, but the idea is this, Rich, okay? You're taking a dollar. You're not gonna take in a dollar unless you know you can make two, $3 out of it. That's the idea, 100%. right? 
we're not taking in dollar to spend a dollar. We're taking a dollar with the idea that we already have plans. We already have everything planned out um, to make two, three dollars. So it's inevitable that, you know, big or small, all companies need additional capital to grow. And you look at, like you said, you know, look at Tesla, you even look at, you know, Amazon until recent days, they continue to raise money. I mean, it just, you know, capital is just, um, you, you need capital to grow. It's just that simple. Um, but my, the idea here is that, okay, 10% of something is much better than 100% of nothing, right? I mean, that, that's the idea. I, I mean, and I think as long as we continue to create, you know, shareholder value and continue to grow our market cap uh, and execute on our plans and truly, I mean, maintain our focus, stay focused, stay grounded, uh, uh, then uh, I, I don't think that's gonna be a problem for us or any company. Now, let's just say you're a company and you're watching this video. Is there anything specific you're looking for as like a joint venture partner, uh, an investor? Speak to the people that might be watching this video and if there's something you're looking for, a partnership, is there anything specifically that you might be looking for where someone might be watching this that might be a hedge fund, uh, a joint venture partner, an investor, a high net worth investor? Is there anything specific that you guys are looking for right now? Yeah. Well, we, we're open to all, you know, new opportunities, right? My, my approach is this very simple, Rich. We connect and we talk to all companies and all people because you never know when you're gonna need them, right? So for our shareholders or people watching our interview right now, if you have um, a company or an opportunity, you think that would make a nice fit and you think it should be part of our portfolio, by all means, you know, I'm all ears. So you guys are in the blockchain space you guys are in the mining space looking to have gold backing your blockchain and your stable coin. Can you explain to people that maybe don't understand what is a stable coin? Can you explain what you mean by that term stable coin? I know what you mean by it, but can you explain what you mean by the term stable coin? When you think stable coin, what is a stable coin? Do you mean stable coin because well, of the gold? Okay. A specific so, term for stable coin? So you if you take something, you take something like uh, let's say for, for Bitcoin, right? The value of Bitcoin is purely based on sentiment, right? A stable coin is basically um, a cryptocurrency that is linked to a fiat, like the USD. So in, in, in case, let's say I'll give you a few examples, like you have you know, USDC, which is widely traded on Coinbase, and you have USDT, which is widely adopted by the crypto community. And also you have other stable coins, basically backed by the USD. Now, why, what's the difference? What's the main difference between a stable coin versus other coins like uh, Bitcoin, right? It's all about commercial usage. It's all about commercial usage, right? If I buy something from you, Rich, okay? And I pay you with Bitcoin. Basically, if I buy something, let's say I buy something from you for $100 and I send you $100 worth of Bitcoin, okay? During that time, because Bitcoin doesn't get to you instantly, right? It takes a few minutes. By the time you receive it, if Bitcoin goes up, great, it's good for you, right? What if it goes down and you're not getting $100, now you're getting $97, $98. So it's kind of impractical to use Bitcoin you know, in commercial transactions. And this is where stable coins come in, right? 
if I pay you a hundred USD coins, you're gonna get a hundred US dollars. And that's the difference between stable coins and you know um, uh, and other coins like uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum. Okay, I understand. Now, a lot of people, I mean, that, that has not stopped people from carrying out transactions in Bitcoin and Ethereum, right? No. Uh, but I'm talking about like everyday high volume transactions. Would you consider Tether, USDT, a stable coin? Because it pretty much- Oh, definitely. It's, 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 it's widely adopted by the, you know, by the crypto community. As the most stable coin, it doesn't really move. It's always right around a dollar, right? It's, well, it's because it's packed to the dollar. Correct. So it doesn't right. really move. It's the only coin I know of really in the crypto space that is just kind of stable, right? Um, most of the other ones have wild swings, including Bitcoin, where it could swing up or down $1,000 in a day very easily, very comfortably. It just, it just has. So um, it's interesting that you want to create a stable coin. I think that that's a great idea. And I love blockchain. Like I get, I get, uh, I have a trading academy and I get paid in Bitcoin every week. And I love the functionalities of Bitcoin because it allows me to send money. It allows me to invest with Bitcoin. If I want to hold it and it goes higher, I can invest by just holding it. It allows me to convert to fiat. It allows me to transfer to other Bitcoin wallets. It allows me to convert to fiat and then transfer to my bank account. I believe Bitcoin, in my opinion, is the number one cryptocurrency in the world by far. Bitcoin has 61% dominance of the entire cryptocurrency space. I know a lot of people believe there's going to be new coins, there's going to be better coins. I have trouble believing that because I've seen Bitcoin for years dominate. Now, it's possible that someone else is going to come, you know, a new coin is going to come and become bigger and better than Bitcoin in the future because a lot of people say Bitcoin technology is old and that something new and something better, something improved is going to come. What do you think about that? Do you agree with that? Or do you think that Bitcoin will always be the dominant cryptocurrency? Because I still believe that Bitcoin will maintain its dominance. And I have troubles believing that anybody else can take the domination away from Bitcoin when they have 61% of the entire market share of the entire crypto world. What do you think about that? Right. Well, here, here's the thing. Okay, I think the future is, you know, Bitcoin has a very, very bright future. No doubt about it. But at this point in time, I mean, Bitcoin is not fully institu um, institutional grade yet, Rich. And this is where gold comes in, right? So, Institutional investors, I mean, uh, I mean, people with billions and billions of dollars to invest. Okay, don't get me wrong. A lot of institutional investors and a lot of funds are already dipping their toes into the Bitcoin market space. But the majority of them are still, you know, um, stuck on traditional assets. And this is where gold comes in, right? So go back to what we were talking about earlier, like stable coin, Rich. In order for you to issue, let's say, 1,000 stable coins packed to the US dollars, you actually have to have $1,000 deposited in a custodian account, certified by an independent auditor, right? Otherwise, what's gonna stop anybody from issue coins? The same thing with gold, is in, in order for us to issue gold back coins, we actually have to have physical deposit of our gold in a trust account, in a custodian account, and certified by a sort of, I mean, a licensed, you know, a trust company and also uh, um, an auditor, right? And this is why, this is where, you know, I believe, you know, uh, the, the future for gold and Bitcoin will go hand in hand in parallel. You know, for that, you know, for a particular reason, Rich, it's just that institutionally, I mean, gold is still, you know, it's still more already at this point than, than Bitcoin. 100%. To get, you know, to, to get, you know, uh, traditional financial institutions to adopt in this movement to digital finance. I agree. Here in Canada, I don't know the exact number, but apparently there was more money raised for gold in the last year 
than ever in the history of the gold sector here in Canada. I think it's in the billions of money that's just been pouring into junior miners, uh, large, large, larger miners like Barrick Gold. Obviously, he, they received a huge investment from Warren Buffett. That is very bullish for gold when you've got the most highly touted investor of our generation pouring in hundreds of millions of dollars into Barrick Gold. That's very bullish for gold obviously, because that's a man that everybody follows. One of the most successful investors ever. So when you see that, you have to obviously believe that that is the trend. Now, I believe, and like you mentioned, if gold is successful, digital gold, Bitcoin will most likely be successful. And if you watch them and you trade them like I do, you can literally see that they typically go up together. Have you noticed this? So when gold goes up, Bitcoin goes up. If Bitcoin goes down, gold goes down. It's not 100%, but very typically they follow each other. Is that part of your rationale too? That, okay, well, if Bitcoin's going to go up and gold's going to go up, well, I might as well be working with both because they go hand in hand and it's like a perfect marriage. Well, well, let's go back real quick to Warren Buffett, right? If you notice, if you've been watching him, you can see that, you know, he has made an exit on most of his, you know, uh, investment in uh, traditional banks. Yes. And travel, all his travel stocks, sold them all. Right. And where did he put his money? He put his money in, you know, in gold companies. Gold. Barrett Gold, 500 million. Yeah. And, and this also goes back to what I'm saying, that everything is going digital, right? Gold is going digital. And traditional uh, and big time investors like Mr. Warren Buffett, okay, they believe in a time tested asset like gold. Right? Now, gold, um, Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin, the reason why Bitcoin, um, you know, it, it's kind of still, uh, something silly. Rich, but I, I've been thinking about this. I mean, why is Bitcoin going up so much? I think it's just, as a human, we like to associate ourselves with something shiny. You think about it, <laughs> right? It's gold, it's Bitcoin. It's one of the first cryptocurrency with, with a shiny, you know, um, emblem. Um, but is 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 um, is you think of Bitcoin purely from a technological standpoint? Is basically proof of concept. Right? But also at the same time, it has proven the point that as people, okay, if we get together and we adhere to a set of rules, we really don't need banks to create or governments to create a value out of something. I mean, and that's, that's the point about Bitcoin, right? It's about democratizing everything. It's about decentralizing everything. And that's... Well, I don't want to make a point. I don't want to make it sound like we want to bypass governments and we want to bypass regulation. That's not the point here. The point here is allowing people direct access to banking services without using a bank. We're always going to need banking services. You always need to receive payments. You're always going to need to make payments. But the point, do you actually need a bank to carry all that out for you? That's the whole point here. Right, Rich? I mean, I love it when I'm sending Bitcoin no bank needs to be involved. I don't got to call anybody. I don't got to pay a wire fee. I can just send you money. Exactly. And it's it's incredible. It's 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 empowering. And like you said, how it's helping the unbankable. People can't get a bank account and they may be living under the poverty line, but if they're my friend or they're my family, I can send them money instantly if they have a phone. And even in countries where people are unbankable, they all have phones. I've seen it in the Dominican Republic. I'm sure you've seen it in other countries as well, where there's very a lot of poverty, but they got phones. So you can send them Bitcoin on their phone. You just need their Bitcoin, Bitcoin wallet address. And like you said, it's like sending an email. So many people are afraid of Bitcoin. Guys, I'm going to tell you this. Bitcoin is the future. And when you learn to use Bitcoin, you will understand the, the simplicity of it. Because it is actually a very simple transaction when you're using Bitcoin. In fact, it is the simplest transaction when, when I'm trying to send money. It is the easiest way to send money. I can't think of anything easier. You give me your Bitcoin wallet address. I, I decide how much I'm going to send you. 
I put in your Bitcoin wallet address. I determine how much I want to send you. I press confirm and it's sent. Like there's nothing like it. And, but yet so many people are afraid. People are afraid of Bitcoin. People are intimidated by Bitcoin. People don't understand Bitcoin. When do you think that we get over this hump where people actually start understanding, hey, you know what? I need to understand Bitcoin. I need to start using Bitcoin. I need to start making a part of my day-to-day -day life because I still see a huge gap. You know, for every 100 people I meet, maybe one understands Bitcoin. And, and that's my own honest opinion. Maybe I'm wrong with those numbers, but there's very few people that deal with it, right? And the ones that do deal with it swear on it and don't want to do anything else. And that should speak to the power of it because I love it. But those that don't, it's almost as if they're afraid of the unknown. When do you think we get over this hump and it becomes mainstream? Is it five years? Is it 10 years? Is it 20 years? Is it one year? Because I still think that we're far away from that as far as making it mainstream where the average person can say, yeah, I got a Bitcoin wallet and I use Bitcoin every day and I'm going to use Bitcoin to pay for this and pay for that. What do you think about that? Well, this, this to me is there's no set timeline for this, right? Uh, Rich, it's about adoption, it's about necessity. Um, over here, let's say, you know, in the US and in Canada, we are filled with, you know, financial services. There's a bank at every corner. I mean, you want a credit card, you have it. You want a debit card, you have it. You want access to PayPal, you have it. Square, whatever you need. It's, it's actually more apparent when you go to, uh, you, when you step over to the emerging world, Rich. Uh, when you go to places like um, Latin America, to Africa, to Asia, right? Uh, in some parts of Asia. Do you know that, you know, close to 1.8 billion people don't have access to banking services, Rich? It's crazy, sad. We, we don't see that. It's not obvious to us here. But when you go to places like that, I mean, it is, so, when you tell people that you should adopt Bitcoin, it doesn't make any sense for us over here because I can pay for goods and services with what I have with a credit card, right? But when you tell people like why you should use Bitcoin, it's about deploying banking services, using banking services, empowering people in other parts of the world. And you should use Bitcoin, you should use blockchain because this is creating economic equality. When you set that in, I mean, then, then you get people to buy into why they should use Bitcoin and blockchain in general, Rich, right? Um, in terms of uh, adoption, realistic adoption at the ground level, this is where I actually think that we need help from traditional financial institutions like banks, right? Okay, they have that retail facing um, uh, presence already that they can actually convert themselves into, I mean, let's say uh, Bank of America or JP Morgan, they can start adding services, crypto related services to their banking customers. I think that would definitely accelerate the adoption of blockchain and crypto and, and cryptocurrencies in general. Now there's investors that are watching this video and we've been live for almost an hour. Uh, Vamanti is now at 40 cents, up 2.83%. Uh, I traded just under 82,000 shares today. So we're hitting new highs and hitting new highs and hitting new highs. What would you want to say to any investor that's watching this video that's interested in potentially investing in your company? What would you say to those people? I, I, what I want to say, we're, we're, we're more, um, I think we're at the end of the beginning. We're just now turning the corner. Um, so there are a lot more projects that we're working on that we're not allowed to disclose to the public yet, um, just because we're under you know, uh, NDAs, et cetera. But uh, like I said, I mean, we, we're just now turning the corner and then uh, you can expect you know, a lot more exciting you know, news and projects um, 
that we will, uh, we're going to be sharing with you in the coming days. That's exciting. I'm very excited to see the progress as it happens. And I'm really excited to continue to watch you and your company evolve. I'm very excited to consistently be able to do these types of videos where we can tell the story, answer questions from shareholders, make it as interactive as possible. And this was actually the first time we've ever done something like this on Twitter. I think the results have been pretty good. We had quite a lot of people uh, jumping on the stream and i um, very excited to see how everything evolves. And as the news comes out, we will do everything I can and I will do everything I can to cover your news and to continue to tell your story. Thank you so much, Tan Tran, CEO of Vimanti Group. Congratulations on all your success and we'll continue to tell your story. Okay, thank you very much, Rich. This is also my, my, my first live streaming broadcast as well. And I, I look forward to do many more uh, of uh, sessions like this. Yeah, same with me. Thank you so much, Tan. I look forward to doing it again. Let's do it more often. And like I said, anytime you have any big news, breaking news, we'd love to invite you onto Rich TV Live so we can discuss it live and interactive in front of your community, our community, and hopefully tell the story and share your story with members and investors all over the world. Vimanti Group, VMNT, we've just talked about an OTCQB listing, a gold mine, your e-loan business, and what's coming for VMNT. Thank you so much for your time today. We've been live for almost an hour, 10. I'll let you get back to work. I know you're busy. I'm gonna get back to work. We're gonna continue to tell the story. And thank you guys for watching. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to comment. Let us know any questions you might have. If someone wants to get a hold of you, Tan, what's the best way for them to reach you? They can just send emails to info at vermonti.com or they you just call our, our number. The number is posted on our website, Rich. Okay, fantastic. All right. Or they can just uh, you know, post a question to our uh, uh, Twitter, our company Twitter account. Perfect. Well, thank you right. so much. Thank Tan. you, Rich. Thank you for your time today. Have yourself a great day. And I look forward to speaking to you soon. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye for now. Have a nice day, everybody. Thank you guys for watching.